In case you haven't noticed, we are in a presidential election here in the United States. Just a few weeks away, right? We're in the heat of it, the thick of it. And while I love politics, I really do, I'm finding this election particularly dispiriting. So much of what we're hearing is what's wrong with our nation and who's to blame. Whether it's in paid ads or political commentary or cable news, much of the media time is dominated by how bad things are. And frankly, we don't need the volume turned up reminding us of the problems that we face here in America or the problems that the world faces. Some days it is easy, it is easy to be weighed down by the problems and issues that swirl around. It's too easy to even list them. War, terrorism, questionable regimes trying to acquire nuclear weapons, global climate change that's having a short-term and long-term effect upon our planet, a fragile national and international economy, unemployment, increased polarization among our politicians, and a nation that seems to be at stalemate. And as a rabbi, as I look out and look at the fragmented Jewish community that's struggling and I read the predictions, I worry about the Jewish future, given the numbers of people who are disaffiliating and unengaged with any organized Jewish institution. Unfortunately, it was way too easy to create this list. And I would guess that even as I was reading my thoughts, you had your own, that you could have added other things to this list that is dispiriting and disturbing about our nation right now. And I didn't include on my list any of the problems that we all carry and face as individuals. Health issues for ourselves or for those we love. Worries about aging parents. Worries about our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren negotiating difficult times. Personal struggles, our financial stability, retirement. It is easy to be overwhelmed by the weight of issues we confront every morning when we awake, every day when we venture from our homes out into the world. Indeed, there would be mornings that it would be a lot easier to just pull the covers back over our head to keep out the noise, to stay safe and secure in our beds with no, no news to disrupt us, no newspapers to disrupt the calm, no angry news chatter to shatter the peace. It would be easy to be like the proverbial ostrich with our heads in the sand, trying to hide from a complex world in which we face challenges. They abound all around us and failure seems now to be a genuine possibility. Get in the face of despair, in the face of fear. There is hope. In the face of an uncertain future, there is hope. In the face of worry and in the face of doubt, there's hope. I believe in hope. Unless you think me naive, let's take some time to consider hope. Hope, what is it? The belief based upon experience that people can affect change. That people individually and collectively have the capacity to fix the problems that we face. We can meet the challenges of the day with integrity and creativity, and that people have the possibility to change within themselves and to rise up to a higher, nobler sense of self. And that people working together can feed the hungry. We can shelter the homeless. We can heal those who are ill and we can lift up the fallen. Hope is grounded in observation, in seeing what people have done and have the capacity to do. But be clear, hope isn't optimism. Optimism is the belief that everything is simply going to turn out okay. Because. 
because the stars align, because the mysterious hand of fate is going to be working in the background. Optimism is more magic than it is fact. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of London, chief rabbi of the Orthodox congregations there, put it this way, and I'm paraphrasing a bit from a sermon I listened to. He said, optimism is the belief that things are going to get better. It needs no courage, just naivete, to be an optimist. Well, hope, hope is the belief that if we work hard enough together, things will get better. Hope takes courage. Rabbi Sachs isn't alone in this appreciation and his understanding of, of hope. The former president of, Czechoslovak of Czechoslovakia and became the first president of the Czech Republic, President Havel, who was more than just a politician. He was an essayist, a, po uh, a poet, a playwright. He said, hope is a state of mind not of the world. Hope is a feeling that life and work have meaning. You either have it or you don't, regardless of the state of the world that surround us. Like, like those individuals and so many others, I, I am a prisoner of hope. As Cornell West, American philosopher, academician, if active, is said in a commencement speech in 1993. He based those words on the work of James, William James, an American psychologist and philosopher who understood hope to be the courage to act, the courage to act when doubt is warranted. Hope. Hope. It exists in many ideas and many philosophies and many thinkers. <laughs> And it's also part of our Jewish tradition. It is, I would argue, a core stream that reaches back to antiquity, to our earliest legends, to our earliest wanderings, to ourselves gathering as a people. It goes back to the Torah portion that we read on Rosh Hashanah and we'll read again tomorrow. As Rabbi Baum noted, it is a odd Torah portion, plopped right in the middle of the story of Joseph, and they didn't make a musical about Judah and Tamar. <laughs> it's right there. It's intrigue, deception, illicit sex. But there's something also very mundane in that Torah portion, something very pedantic that most of us who read the Torah as modern people really aren't interested in. It's the aspect of genealogy, who begat who, right? That lineage of birth after birth after birth, and these names run together after a while, we can't figure out why they're listing them. And in this Torah portion, there's a birth. Right at the end, Judah gives birth to twins. And those twins play an important role, or one of those twins, plays an important role in Jewish genealogy. One of those twins is the ancestor of King David. King David, probably best known for the legend of him slowing uh, Goliath, right? They wrote a story to tell us how great he was going to be as a king, and King David did wonderful things. And one of those children that Tamar gave birth to was one of his great, 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 great grandparents. Why is that important? Why would that be included in the story, this deception? Because King David is also the line out of which the Messiah comes. The Messiah. Unless you jump to a place in modernity, you need to pause a second. We need to talk about that old Jewish concept, the Messiah. It comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach, which means anointed. And yes, in Judaism early on, there was this notion. And the earliest iteration of that notion, because like all things in Judaism, it changed. Right? We don't keep anything the same. And that earliest notion of the Messiah was a person, a very human person, a military figure or a political figure who was going to help the children of Israel in political difficult times, time when there was unrest and military challenge, and that person was going to rise up and help to usher in a time of peace and create a healthy environment. It was a human notion of a Messiah. 
But in time, it changed. And the concept of it within Judaism evolved and it became maybe more of a, let's say, spiritual or, or religious or outside of human being notion of a Messiah. But what's interesting about us as a people is even when this notion of that sort of magical Messiah created, there was a sense of skepticism. We just didn't quite buy that notion. We, as Rabbi Sachs said, aren't naive optimists. We want to actually see it to believe it. And so there was written a legend, a midrash, that's attributed to a first century rabbi. A midrash that raises doubt about this notion that problems will be solved outside of us. It was attributed to Rabbi, rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. And he said, if you should be holding a sapling in your hand, when they tell you that the Messiah has arrived, first plant the sapling and then go out and see the Messiah. <laughs> Skepticism. Judaism from the first century said, we better get our hands dirty. We better dig in the muck and the mire if it's going to change, because change is going to come from us and not from outside. And that idea continued to evolve, and Reformed Judaism gave it a new voice when it changed from a personal notion of Messiah to the Messianic age, an age of justice and peace that would be dominated by people working together. It was out of this notion that, that social justice and, 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 and tikkun alum repairing the world became so important to modern Jews that together, working and struggling and striving, we could make a better world. It was a form of understanding based upon hope that people could do things. This idea was developed by Eric Fromm as well. Many of us probably read Eric Fromm, The Art of Loving in College. That's how we know Eric Fromm. That was nodding, they're going, yeah, I remember that. I like that book. Right after, what was the, you never having to say, I'm sorry, what was that book? Um, it was another book. Okay, I read in college. Eric Fromm was also a Jewish philosopher. A lot of people don't know that. He was a Talmudist. He wrote about Jewish ideas. He wrote a book called You Shall Be His Gods. And he talked about this notion of hope. And he brought new language to it, different than our ancestors. He took a, talked about it from a humanistic perspective. He said, the humanistic conscience is the voice of ourself which summons us back to ourselves to become what we, are, we potentially are. Even his definition of God, his definition of God was the image of our higher self, a symbol of what we potentially are or ought to become. He gave voice to the sense of reaching out, stronger, better doing. Each of these chapters in the evolution of the Jewish people was infused with hope, not naive, naivete, not magical, not dysfunctional, but a strong inherent belief that change is possible, that human beings, that we, that we, if we so choose, can improve the present and we can make the future better. Perhaps the notion is most strongly expressed in the Israeli national anthem, Ha Tikva the hope. It's a national anthem, yes, but it was more than that. It was a mindset of the Jewish people. We hope. In the face of everything, we hope. We believe that change is possible. David Ben-Gurion, the first president, prime minister of Israel, said we could take our destiny into our own hands. And whether we're in Israel tonight or anywhere around the world, Hatikva, that anthem, that message, should infuse our spirit and reminds us that this is what it means to be part of the Jewish experience. I stand in a long line, we stand in a long line of Jewish thinkers and hopers. Though the language has changed over time, it is inherent in the notion of what it means to be Jewish, that we can affect change. So here we are, Kol Nidre. Kol Nidre, we hear the ancient chant, we listen to it, both in word and an instrument, and we pause. We think about the year just ending and the regrets we may carry. We think about the future and the possibilities of change. What is interesting about the Kul Nidre and the words themselves that we frequently don't notice 
is that the Kol Nidre is not about the past. It's all about the future. It says in the English that I read, in all versions of the Kol Nidre that would be chanted around the world this night, let all our vows and all, all the promises we make and all the obligations we incur on ourselves between this Yom Kippur and the next. We're not releasing ourselves from the past. We're releasing ourselves into the future. It is an odd formulation. It was developed 12th century. Rabbeinu Tam changed the tenses. He went from the past to the future. Now, I don't know what he was thinking when he did that. But I know how I read it and I understand it. I think the Kol Nidre says to each of us every year, take a risk. Hope, engage, do. That's what it allows us. It says, jump into the new year with all your hopes and aspirations and willingness to do it. And if you don't make it, that's okay. But you don't start with timid sips from the cup of life. You grab it. You dig the hole if you need to plant the tree. You rush out and you do something and you change. That's the cool Nidre. It says that we should act even when doubt is warranted. I believe in hope. And I believe that in the face of the horrors of the last century, that change is possible. If there isn't the possibility of change, there is no reason to get up in the morning and get out of bed. If there isn't the possibility of change, there's no reason to be here tonight. If the world can't get any better than it is right now, there's no reason to educate our young or, or heal the wounded or, or lift up the fallen. I believe in hope that tomorrow can be better than today, that next year will be brighter than the year to come. I believe in that. Be clear, hope takes courage. It's not passive, it's active and engaged. Grace Paley, the, the author and poet, captured it best when she said, the only recognizable feature of hope is action. Hope is not a reflection of the world is, but what it could be if we, working together, rise above petty differences and narrow visions and create the kind of world we know can exist. It will take courage. It will take vision. It will take people who are willing to accept the challenge and leave tonight willing to take a risk even if we don't succeed. Eleanor Roosevelt taught, in the light of history, it is more intelligent to hope rather than to fear, to try rather than not to try. For one thing we know beyond all doubt, nothing has ever been achieved by the person who says it can't be done. As the new year stretches before us, rich with challenges and possibilities, may we have the courage to act upon the hope that our tradition offers us and that lives within each of us. Even when we fear, even when we are uncertain, hope, hope can shine a, light, a ray of light piercing the darkness and bringing on the light of another day. We are urged by our tradition to act. As Rabbi Tarfon said, it's not our responsibility to finish the work of perfecting the world, but we are not free to desist from it. I believe in hope.